So in my conviction, uh, an ayah is part of a passage, and the passage is part of, obviously, a surah. And a surah is part of a group of surahs. In other words, there's a bigger view. So one has to understand where in the Qur'an the ayah is situated. It's important to, because the Qur'an is a cohesive book. You can't take a sentence in a book out of its context. Right? So if we're talking about a very powerful ayah, then we got to look at what surah is it in? Within that surah, what passage is it in? Where is that surah itself? Some things, not just about the, that, that's all what I'm discussing at the moment is the textual context. And then there's a historical context. And the historical context is when was this surah revealed? When were these, are there any commentaries on when this particular ayah was revealed? Or these set of ayat were revealed? Is there any discussion about that? All of that background information helps shape my thinking about the ayah itself. If I don't do my homework on that background, then I'm going to come to very different conclusions about what the ayah is talking about. I can, it will completely change my view on what the ayah subject matter actually is. Right? This is, uh, and textual context is of the utmost importance in Quranic studies. Allah says, اِعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يُحْيِي الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا Surah Al-Hadid. He says, you should know that Allah gives life to the earth after it had died. Allah gives life to the earth after its death. Now what do you think it's talking about? Plants. Plants. The earth is dead, it rains, and then plants come back to life. But the ayah before talks about hearts becoming hard. فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَكَثِيرٌ مِّنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ اِعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يُحْيِي الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا Their hearts became hard, but many of them are corrupt. You should know Allah gives life to the earth after it had died. Now what's the ayah talking about? Just like the life, lifeless earth can be brought back to life, dead hearts, still hearts, hardened hearts can be brought back to life. Did the text, the context of the ayah change our understanding? Did it influence? Sure. It, can, it brings a new flavor to the text. It brings a new understanding to the text that you wouldn't have had in isolation. The ayat are beautiful in isolation, but they are also, our understanding of them is when they are together. When, they are, when they're in a flow, because it's part of a khutbah that Allah has revealed. It's part of a, a kalam that Allah has revealed. And kalam has to have flow. It has to have you know, uh, continuity. So that's one thing that's really important. Now the way I approach that is something that I learned from the writings of uh, Amin Ahsan Islahi. It was further refined by uh, the, the speeches, the lectures given by Dr. Isar Ahmed on this particular topic on coherence. I read previously and took extensive notes on Mustansir Mir's analysis of coherence in the Qur'an the bottom, the bottom line of all of which is the following basically the Qur'an is number one a cohesive text it's made up of several large sections each large section has a compilation of two kinds of surahs Makki and Madani so each large section of the Qur'an you can divide the Qur'an into seven large sections and each large section has a group of Makki and a group of Madani maybe at least one Makki and a bunch of Madani, or at least one Madani and a bunch of Makki, like that, okay? Um, and he would, uh, Islahi, for example, would argue that the first main section of the Qur'an, this is not the same as Hizb, by the way. He's looking at it from a literary perspective. He would argue the first main Hizb of the Qur'an is actually Fatiha, the Makki, and then Baqara, Ali Imran, Nisa, and Maida, the Madani. So those five make the first portion of the Qur'an. So those two complement each other, meaning Fatiha is complemented by these four surahs as a whole. Okay, and then those four surahs also have a relationship with each other and they form group one and then there's group two and there's group three and group four, group four and by the way by the time you get to the end of the Qur'an you have the shortest Madani section and the longest Makki section so it's actually reversed from where we started okay it's, it's flipped from where we started uh, uh, when you get towards the end anyhow the surah or surah to nur in particular when, when I talk about its, its overall context you'll see why it's important to note that it's a Madani surah and it belongs to a group of surahs, and that it's paired with another surah. It's beautiful that it's paired with another surah historically, and it's also paired with another surah literal, in, in a literary sense. And what's also beautiful is that this other surah is not next to it, it's actually further away. They are apart between each other, there's a gap of Makki surahs. So this is a, this is a Madani surah, there's a bunch of Makki surahs, from, so this is surah number 24, so 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, and 31, and 32 are all Makki. 
The next Madani Surah is actually a sister to this Surah, Surah Al-Ahzab. They're very close to each other. They're close to each other in revelation, they're close to each other in subject matter, and they complement each other very, very beautifully. Okay? So understanding something about how these two are tied together is also going to be important when we t study the overall context of uh, this, this Surah. So that's the, that's the first thing, the placement of a Surah in the Qur'an. The second thing is the structure of a Surah itself. A Surah is made up of several subject matters. Mufassirun have disagreed, those who concern themselves with the subject of Nazm, of how the subject matters are broken apart. But one, of, one fantastic resource that I used to rely on forever and ever and ever uh, was Islahi's work. I think he did a fantastic job tying the passages together and breaking the passages up. But Jazakallahu uh, khairan Shaykh Abu Bakr, I'm obsessed. Um, Mawsu'at al-Tafsir al mawdu'i is, is an invaluable resource. It is actually an, an incredible, incredible resource. I'll write that here. Um, Mawsu'at al-Tafsir al mawdu'i This is like 20 people uh, working on a comprehensive tafsir of the Qur'an. And one of, the, one of your goals of learning Arabic is that you can read this tafsir. If you can read this tafsir, you're fine. You're good. You're set. This is a summary of, like it's, it's authenticating the classical aqwal about what has been said, the context of revelation, all been you know, verified, authenticated by a panel of 20 scholars. Then the structure of the surah, its passages, how they're broken apart from each other, what's the, what's the overall message for one passage, how is this passage related to the next passage. They've done this by heading. Al-Maqta'u al-Awwal, Al-Maqta'u al-Thani, Al-Maqta'u al-Thali, first passage, second passage, third passage, fourth passage, fifth section, sixth section. Surah Al-Nur, for example, has 14 sections according to them. Right, so that, that's been a tremendous resource. And uh, I would probably, if I did my own studies exhaustively beyond that, on Nazm itself, I would probably add my own notes to their study, but 90% of what I was going to figure out, they've already done. 90, if not, not 99%. Maybe I can, if I were to add something, it'd be maybe 0.1% to <laughs> what they've done. It's already done, and it's really, really fantastic work. Okay, so understanding the structure of a surah and what the overall message of the surah is about. Why? Because once you understand that, you understand that everything that's being said is being said in that context. Okay? Why is that important? Why is it important to understand the overall message within a context? I'll give you one example from the Qur'an. I'll give you one example from regular speech. One time I was telling, uh, I was giving a khutbah about the etiquettes of speech and how we're supposed to speak to people nicely. It's a simple message, speaking to people nicely. But I was talking about the value the Qur'an puts on it. The value the Qur'an puts on this idea is that actually when you don't observe it, the very next ayat in Baqarah talk about people killing each other. وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ حُسْنًا وَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةُ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةُ ثُمَّ تَوَلَّيْتُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ عُلِدُمْ ثُمَّ أَنْتُمْ هَا أُولَائِي تَقْتُلُونَ أَنفُسَكُمْ Allah talks about you're going to talk to people nicely. You're going to talk to people nicely. One of the injunctions given to the Israelites. It seems like so basic. Talk to people nicely. I learned that in second grade. My mom keeps telling me, talk to your sister nicely. She doesn't say it nicely, but she means. So why is that so complicated? And the very next ayah says, you were the same people killing each other. How does infighting begin? Propaganda. What is propaganda? Language. Words. Propaganda is nothing but words. I was, uh, uh, there was a report this morning on NPR about Rwanda and the music industry in Rwanda. And how the, Rwanda 20 years ago had a genocide. Yeah. And now, there isn't, and there, there's, there's love songs, you know, in the air. Everybody's making love songs. Even the hip-hop artists are talking about unity and love in Rwanda. And they say, how come you guys don't write anything about the genocide? It's such a big part of your history. It scarred you so badly. How come there's no music about the genocide. And you know what overwhelmingly the artists are saying? First, we don't want to remind ourselves. We know it, it happened. But if we bring it up, we're still a volatile society. A song itself could stir up violence. We're terrified that one song about one tribe, I say something nice, even if I don't say something bad. If I say one thing too nice about one tribe, or if I praise the president or something, we don't know if it's going to start, killing's going to start again. Speaking is a pretty big deal. So I was talking about Bani Israel, Allah told them, Qulu lil nasi husnan. After the khutbah, a brother comes up to me and says, Why are you talking about the Jews? You should give a khutbah about Muslims. 
Now my entire khutbah was about Muslims. And I was telling us, telling ourselves, our congregation, how we should, we should take advice from Banu Israel. I was like, when did you come to the khutbah? He goes, five minutes before Salat. I was like, but you didn't understand what I said. I, this was, there was a context. It doesn't matter what you said. That's what you said. I was like, there's a lot more that I said. But if you take it out, then you're like, he's not even talking about Muslims. He's giving us a fun history lesson about the Jews or something. You know, why don't you care about Muslims and how they speak, etc., etc. You know, context can change everything. It can make something relevant, irrelevant. If you pull it out of context. So that's going to be a key in us appreciating the ayah that we're going to be studying. Understanding the passage it's in, its relationship to other passages, and the overall message of the surah. We're going to have to deal with that, okay? Then when you get to an ayah, then my, 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 my own methodology, this is the context, that these, this is the groundwork, this is the hardest part in my opinion. Then the easy part begins, that's research. The next part is research. And research is about this ayah, first of all, what are the classical positions? If, are, there, are there extensive conversations about historical context? Are there reports from Sahaba or even a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, related to this particular ayah? Um, and if, if so, what are they and how are they to be not just read but analyzed? Uh, studying history is one thing, knowing history is one thing, analyzing history is something entirely different. Somebody can know all the facts about Hudaybiyah but not be able to analyze that history. Right? Historical analysis is really, really important, not just historical data and information. Oftentimes the athar or the text will give you the data, but it won't offer you the analysis. Right? So you have to look at history and you have to analyze also what's going on here. What's the, what, how's the, the scene to be painted? And this is the great of some, some great ulama in our time and even classical writers who've taken history and they've also analyzed it for us. Okay? So understanding that history, analyzing that history, that's important, that's the second step. Uh, then there is classical commentary. I start usually with classical commentary. What that means is I go to certain tafasir of old and see if they have, what insights they have to offer into this ayah. Above and beyond what I found already in the context, do they have other things that they have to say or you know, things that the first two or three generations of Muslims have had to say about this ayah, which is important history and important for our understanding, right? So I'll go to, I'll go to a few tafasir, I'll, I'll write those for you. Um, I'll have an easy start with the Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah. Uh, I will go to the Al-Qurtubi. I used to go to At-Tabari, I don't anymore uh, because At-Tabari has too many things and I don't have the qualifications to be able to sift through what is and isn't authentic. At-Tabari, as you uh, probably heard in the talk by Sheikh Omar also, was a historian. So he collected everything, right? Authentic and authentic. If he heard it, he collected it kind of thing. So it has historical value, but for research purposes, it can become difficult to navigate. Al-Qurtubi is far easier to get through. Um, so on the, the Athari side or Riwayah side, I'll go, go through these tafasir. Then there are some that are analytical tafasir with a mix of uh, 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 both of these. I'll read Ibn al-Jawzi. Then I move up a little bit and I start reading linguistic tafasir. So I read uh, Al-Gashaf, which, which is the Makhshari uh, his commentary. He's a Mu'tazilite. I'm not a fan of his i'tizal, but I am a fan of his linguistic analysis. It's fun. Uh, then I will read um, an nuhas if he has anything to offer about the I'rab of the ayah, some extensive I'rab of the ayah. I will also read Razi, who is a fun read when he's not on tangents. Uh, but Razi was brilliant. He was a really brilliant writer. Even though he took a lot from Zamakhshadi, like a lot. You just, almost the same passage you'll find it in his tafsir just sitting right there. But he did have some really cool comments. Um, then I'll, so this is more on the linguistic side. Razi is kind of a comp, uh, mix between linguistic and literary in some sense. Then I move on to, um, which one was next after Razi? Oh, Al-Biqa'i. He's fun. He likes to write in poetry. That's, that gets annoying sometimes. If he was there, I was like, Sheikh, can you just tone it down a little? But he's gone, so. But he, write, he likes to talk about how ayat are connected to each other. Um, a tough read, nonetheless. I'll, I'll plow through it if I can, uh, to the best of my ability. And then after Al-Biqa'i, 
Uh, then I start going to more contemporary works. So I'll read Al uh, Ashokani, Fathul Qadir. I should put Zamakhshid here instead of Kashaf. That's the author. Uh, Fathul Qadir. And then I get to one of my favorites of all time, which is uh, Ibn Ashur, At Tahrir wa Tanweer. Now we're getting even more contemporary. So then I'll read a Sha'rawi. And after Sha'rawi is done, then I will read uh, Sorry, blah. Okay. Then I'll see if there's any linguistic commentary or some cool nuances mentioned by Dr. Samir Rai on the ayah. Um, and then I will go to Sharawi, then Samir Rai, then okay, now I'll listen to the Dars of Ratib al-Nabulsi on the ayah, of course, because he's like the, he's like the loving, cuddly grandpa of Tafsir. It's so nice to listen to him. You feel like he's just patting you on the back when you're listening to him. It's so, like, you just want to cry. You turn into a baby when you listen to him. He's got this very fatherly tone to him. It was wonderful. Uh, okay, so now I'm done with the Arabic side, Arabic tafsir side, and then I'll go to uh, listen to, uh, I'll read Islahi, this is, these are Urdu sources, Islahi, uh, and then I, on QuranExplorer.com there is uh, Sheikh, what's his name? I always forget his name. From Chicago, Triple I, the Algin Madrasa, anybody know? Malana, no? Ah, thank you, Malana Abdul Salim. Malana Abdul Salim has a, a complete uh, tafsir of the Quran recorded on audio tape and they turned it into MP3s. It's on QuranExplorer.com. Fun listening. I, I will read uh, the, the uh, Malana, you know, Taqi Uthmani, his father. Uh, why am I blanking on names today? Mufti Shafi'ah, yeah, tafsir, uh, Mufti Shafi'ah. Ma'arif al Quran. I'll read him. I'll listen to Dr. Sarah Mazdars if it's detailed. Uh, he had two kinds of durus uh, Bayan al Quran and uh, Dars al Quran. If Dars al Quran is available, it's golden. Oh my God, it's amazing. But it's very rare. It's not for the whole Quran. He did it for a few surahs. The ones he did, though, are, pff, boy, that's some amazing stuff. The guy was incredible. You know, he studied Western philosophy extensively and used to refute it in his lecture sitting in Lahore. People didn't even know what he's talking about. He's like quoting Kant and Nietzsche and like, and, go, and he knows it. Like he was invited to the Society of Scriptural Reasoning over here uh, in the 90s. And he'd like, this professors from like Hartford Seminary and you know, this, uh, Yale are sitting there like, how does this guy know this stuff? And just ripping them apart from Surah An-Nur. This was amazing. It was a thing to watch. Uh, Dars al-Quran, they're called Dars al-Quran, if available. Very hard to find, uh, but I have tapes. That's why I have a tape player in my house. I've be because of him, I have a tape player in my house. Uh, yep, you, you just got to have it, seriously. Uh, so now this is the tafsir studies. Uh, then there's the word study. You wonder why I don't do detailed studies. Because if I did, I wouldn't do anything else. So when you do an ayah, it'll take you a while. It'll take you a while. This took me, all of Ramadan took me Surah Nuh. Just Surah Nuh. To do it like this. It takes a while. And it's not even studying this stuff. That's not the hard part. When you have all these notes, there, are there, are there, is there overlap? to skim through all of the overlap and to turn it into something you can actually teach, that's the painful part. So he already said this, he said this, okay, I gotta combine these two, and that's been said, that's been said here, okay, I gotta get these two together. And so you have 70 pages of notes, and then you gotta turn them into like three pages, or four pages, or 10, in this case, this is 14 pages for today, the ayah. Right, because you gotta, you gotta skim. So now word study, lisan uh, al-ara, oh no, I'll start with lanes. Then I'll read Lisan al-Arab. 
then I read uh, Al Muhit. I really, really like uh, Qutuf. I really like this book. My new love, Fiqh al uh, There's a book, there's a thesis called Daqaiq al Furuq, Li Kalimat al Quran. I love it. It's great. Tajal Urus. And then the Urdu sources are. Oh, and sometimes, not all the time, I'll go to Mutaradifat al Quran. Or, uh, no, Mufradat al Quran, sorry. Then the Urdu sources, and there's one that's like super juicy. It's called Mutaradifat al Quran. That's for synonyms. There's another Arabic source, Al Furuq al I should mention that. Again, synthesizing, like going through this stuff and kind of taking uh, what you need to, to draw, to skim, 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 and get to like, okay, here's where we're at. How much do you water them down? Uh, I, I wouldn't call it watering it down. I would actually call it uh, summarizing because a lot of information is overkill for teaching purposes. Like for example, they'll take a verb like, you know, we're going to do khimar, uh, probably not today, but we're going to do khimar, right? And when we do it, well, how did the Arabs use it? And there's, they show you like a hundred phrases in which they use the word khimar in different ways, right? So I, I could walk you through all of it and you're going to feel the pain when I do walk you through some of it even because some of it is a couple of pages. Right, but there's a lot more. So when there's redundancy like that, I say, okay, well, you know, we can skip some of that stuff. Point made through examples A and B. You're convinced. I don't need to convince you more of the same point through 80 more examples. Right. So I'll, I'll eliminate. I'll try to eliminate some redundancies from it. Uh, when I do teach for a tafsir lecture, like uh, you know, when I started this process with uh, with Juzamma, boy, I, I had to not talk about 80 percent of what I studied. I had to just, it's, there's no time, there's no, people are going to go crazy, man. I wasn't, that, just teaching just Amma took me two, two, three years. Right, so if I actually did it the way my notes were suggesting, <laughs> we'd still, still be doing it. Just Amma wouldn't get, so you got to decide between functional and, you know, overkill, kind of, right? So, so anyway, this is not how I study for any, any which ayah. This is when I've decided to study an ayah. I'll take this method and then, you know, fuse all the notes together and put it all together and then, okay, now I'm ready for an ayah.